Okay, we're going to um, start off our session today by um, saying hello to everybody. And this is really all about encouraging women to take a chance and try Paris for it. So thank you for joining us. You'll see the lovely Candace Comden there uh, in our image. Um, we are today going to be talking about why para athletes are trying para sports and the barriers that need fixing. Uh, the last time we met, we really went through a lot of the research around, you know, the state of the nation, uh, what was working, what was not. And today we're really going to dig deep into the whole trial part of things because that's really the first step in getting people to participate. Um, so we're looking forward to having a, um, a discussion with Candice around that. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, how to build program awareness and host your own try it programs, thanks to uh, OnPara. Um, we're also going to chat about how to start your own Parasport club. Um, and we're throughout the whole piece, we are going to be, you know, sharing um, and, you know, putting out challenges that we're dealing with and experiences that we've had. And um, we're looking forward to our networking session at the end of our uh, experience. Okay. All good. Um, here's your team of uh, hosts today. Um, Candice, Team Ontario Wheelchair Athlete. Hi, Candice. Uh, Catherine um, from uh, Ontario Para Network. And we've got Emily from Parasport Ontario and uh, myself from uh, See What You Can Do and my other colleagues, Mark and Caroline, are also on the line. Okay. Um, and I really wanted to give you a brief intro to our Paramazing Circle. This is now um, our second cross-collaborative um, session that we are having together. This session is typically hosted by our two co-hosts, Jessica Lewis. She is now a three-time uh, Paralympian. She just uh, she got back from Tokyo not too long ago. And Jess Silver, who is an adaptive fitness coach, uh, she's also the founder and executive director of Flex for Access, which is a not-for-profit aimed at helping to make mainstream uh, fitness more accessible. Um, the two ladies were unable to join us today, but they did send a quick greeting video. So I'd like to play that for you all, if you don't mind. Please let me know if it sounds okay. Hi everyone, my name is Jess Silver. I'm the executive director and founder of Flex Access, an adaptive athlete and a fitness consultant and also one of the co-leaders of the amazing Paramazing Circle. And I'm here with my friend Jess Lewis, a Paralympian, and we are very excited to be with you here today. You're going to have a great session with Candice and I'll throw it over to Jess now and we're looking forward to seeing you at the next circle. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, I hope you have a fantastic session um, as well with uh, Parasport Ontario and On Parent Network. So we'll see you at the next circle. Yeah, and we want you to engage with adaptive fitness and sport promotion in order to amplify uh, the voices of the, those women in the adaptive community and also to allow us to be strong and healthy, fit, uh, females and to continue to engage with uh, life at its fullest through the pursuit of fitness and sport. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your session. Thanks, ladies. <laughs> um, so it's pretty amazing um, that we have so many great relationships um, with para-athletes, but astonishingly, what we saw the last time we met was that the majority of women with disabilities are not involved in sport. So that means that you know, a good portion of our population is not benefiting from all the great things that come from sport. Um, and women with disabilities obviously uh, often experience double the discrimination. So, um, so that's really one of the things we're trying to tackle practically today. And we're glad to have so many great experts on the line with us. Um, we're going to jump right in. Um, by having a conversation with Candice around why she started Parasports and the barriers that she feels need fixing. So Candice, this is Candice, and you see her on the line, but I love this photo of her uh, because um, A, she's, she's so powerful and she's inspiring. I don't know if any of you follow her on Instagram, but I love Candice, your, your quote, your daily quotes, your inspirational quotes. <laughs> So I stole this one. I know, I know you stole it from Billie Jean King, but I mean, it's, it's such a great quote and, you know, it looks like you're like 
smashing it in across the court to show people. You can thank Catherine for that photo. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so you Catherine. <laughs> I got the phone <laughs> heads at the bottom of that one. That's amazing. She makes me look really good. I love it. <laughs> oh, I think you probably do a pretty good job of that. Um, so that's amazing. So thank you um, uh, so much, Candice, for yeah, nice. checking in with us. I'm going to end my show and actually go live with you so that we can see more of you. So I'm going to stop presenting for a minute. There we go. And there she is, and I can see your beautiful face. Okay, awesome. Well, so let's start with um, our first question. And please, if you have questions, there's not very many of us on the line right now. We do have a number of other registrants. I'm not sure if they're joining later, um, but there's not very many of us. So if you have something you want to ask Candice, please, you know, you can dump it into the chat or just, you know, raise your hand, and we'll make sure that we we get to you. Um, so we wanted to start by asking you. A little to share your story a little bit how you got started in para sports oh here's shireen for sure and, um, um and wheelchair tennis yeah definitely so i growing up was not a sports person at all i was that kid who was in the corner please don't pay attention to me <laughs> i don't want anybody to know who i am um so i didn't really find para sports until my late 20s um but before that, I actually had an experience which caused me to not want to play sports, unfortunately, um, at seven years old, playing on a t-ball team. And I had uh, another one of my teammates kind of point at me and say, ha you can't run. And it just, for whatever reason, that comment had an effect on me as a seven-year-old kid going, oh, you know what? That kid's right. I can't run like he can run, right? So why, why would I even bother trying trying to play with the other kids, trying to be involved. Um, so long story short, I shied away from, you know, the parasport community, didn't even realize parasports were a thing. I thought, well, sports I can't do, therefore I don't do. <laughs> um, you know, I was just, I was very introverted, very on my own all the time. Please don't look at me. Um, and I still very much am that person, but, um, you know, I think, I, I don't know if I was, I think it was seven years ago or something like that where, um, I'd actually seen a try it day from on para, which was back then the Ontario wheelchair sports association. They had posted on their Facebook about a try it day for wheelchair for wheelchair tennis. And I actually grew up watching tennis with my mom. It was something that we did on the weekends together. We spent hours in front of the TV, watching our favorite tennis players, loved tennis, didn't ever think I would be able to play it. Um, but just thought, you know what, like, this sounds like a lot of fun. I'm going to take a, take a chance at this point and, and, and give it a try. And I ended up falling in love. And the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> so what, uh, what was it you think that gave you the courage to take that step to try it? You know what, Tina, I honestly, still to this day, I don't know what drove me to just all of a sudden be like, yeah, I'm going to try that. That sounds like a good idea. I've never played a sport in my life. <laughs> but there was something about, you know, seeing seeing the poster online online and seeing people like me, right? People in wheelchairs, people that looked like me playing a sport, having fun time, playing a sport that I loved, right? So and I think that was a big part of it is just having that accessibility and that, that um, I can't think of the word right now, it's escaping me, but just seeing other people like me online and realizing that I wasn't alone. There are other people like me out there who are doing things that I could be doing. And you stuck it out. So clearly something about the experience worked for you. Oh, so what was honestly, it about the experience? It, yeah, it was, I had such a blast. I think I left there like determined that I was going to be involved in wheelchair tennis in some way, shape or form, whether I was going to be an athlete or volunteer at these triumph days or whatever the situation was, I knew leaving that court that day that I was going to be involved in some way and that other people needed to also be involved, right? Because I had the most fun that I have had in probably that 27 years or however old I was. Um, I, had a, I had a blast, you know, like we had Kai Schreemeyer, who is a, I believe, three-time Paralympian um, who was running the session and he was fantastic. He made it so much fun. We did, you know, fun little drills and he didn't make me feel like I didn't know what I was doing, which I probably didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> but he just made it fun. And, and I had a blast and I knew that I just needed to be involved. Amazing. So you said you were 27 when you 
try? No, that's <laughs> now that I'm thinking I was younger than that for sure. I was probably I was gonna like, say, you don't look like you're old enough to have tried it. To <laughs> I'm 34 almost now, so I feel okay. like that's probably accurate, but a little bit younger than that, probably. Yeah. Mid okay, so, so beyond. I mean, I mean, maybe you were one of your biggest obstacles, like in, in trying, but what I would get to is your barriers and the challenges and, and some of the things that you experience before you got there. And I guess you still experience now, like what are some of the challenges and barriers that, that you sure. have to kind of work with? Yeah, definitely. So, um, one of them for me specifically is um, just the accessibility of it all, because I grew up in Newmarket. Um, which back in the day was not as big of a town as it is now. Um, you know, it was much smaller back then. There wasn't a lot of para sport or accessible sport options growing up. You know, even I tell people, you know, in high school going to gym class, I was excluded a lot of the time because there just wasn't any way for me to be included. They didn't know back then, right? They didn't understand that there were options. Um, and I know that, um, that, when you live in the bigger towns like Toronto and, and things like that, there are a, a few more options for you. But um, I just think for me, growing up in a small town, there wasn't anything. And the transportation to get to those things in Toronto, right? Like I wasn't going to travel to Toronto, you know, every weekend to go and play a pair of sport. Um, that just wasn't feasible. A lot for my parents, for myself, you know, we had lives and family and lots of other different things, right? So for me, definitely... Um, I would say the biggest barrier was the accessibility of the para sports themselves, which again is getting better these days, which I'm so thankful for because other people get the opportunities that I didn't necessarily have growing up. So amazing. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being a spokesperson for people and for being out there. Cause like, like what happened with you in terms of representation and seeing yourself out there, it's just so great for people to see themselves. For sure. Right. Um, so if you could um, have kind of a dream list of like what, I guess maybe what an ideal program would look like, you know, for you to, to try a sport, what, what would that, like, what would some of the elements of that be? Um, you know what, I think, I mean, Ampera is doing a great job with their try it days with all of their sports that they do. I know Cruiser Sports is also doing a great job where the, it's just getting the word out there. You know, like I feel like if people knew about these things, there would be so many more people involved because you just you don't hear about it as often, unfortunately. And and again, it's getting better um, nowadays, but there's still, I think, um, sort of a, that barrier of just not knowing how to contact the people that need to hear it the most. You know, when I was growing up with a disability, nobody came to my parents and said, hey, you have a kid with a disability? Here, you need to try this, this, this. You can access this. You can go put her in this sport. You can do this. It just wasn't there um, if you didn't go really looking for it, right? right? So I think having that easy access would be make a world of difference for sure. So you're saying the access and the awareness. Yes, And then 100%. when you got home, it sounds like you had some pretty engaging um, – leaders and it was fun oh yes and amazing that's cool okay um so maybe talk to us a little bit about you know why you think you know you had, when we talked part of this conversation you had talked about how you had wished there was some sort of a hub or something where you could find out about this information and and that's one of the things we do at see what she can do is we're kind of um, the bridge between, you know, athletes and the organizations and professionals that are out there so that people can come and see themselves in the stories, but also find the organizations and the programs that can help them do their thing. So do you want to speak a little bit about kind of the importance of that, that community and, and circles like this for you as an athlete, where you can connect with organizations? Oh, 100%. When you guys approached me to do this, I had, you know, I honestly, I, don't think I may have heard like something about you guys, but not very much. Right. So when, when you approached me, I thought, well, this is amazing. Like what an opportunity to come and speak to people who are having this shared interest. Like I have to, you know, get Parasport out there and get people involved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and specifically women as well, you know, cause I think as women, our superpower, one of our superpowers is, is empathy, right? Like we, we empathize with each other. We want to support each other. We want to have a safe space where we can talk to other people like us 
and, and talk and tell our stories and ask our questions and not feel like we're being judged. Right. And so I think that for me is one of the biggest, most important things in having these hubs and these circles is having that community of people around you to support you. Because I know having a great support system myself throughout my tennis career, how important that is to my success. Right. And I think that that would make a world of difference for so many women out there and people out there, um, you know, a para athletes out there, if they just knew that there was something there where people were supporting them and had their backs. Okay. Now tell us you're competing in nationals. You said in Montreal. Yes. Is there a way that we can watch you from there? Will there be a live stream? Um, I don't think so. Catherine might know a little bit more about that than I do. I, I mean, unless like my own Facebook is going to live stream it, <laughs> then I mean, by all means, follow yeah. me on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I heard. <laughs> as far as I know, I don't think it's being live streamed. Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't yeah, we'll do we'll do some research with Catherine after after the call. And if there is yeah. a live stream, we'll make sure we get it out to everybody so that we can all watch Definitely. you kick butt, Candace. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it's you know what I heard was you know awareness is key in getting people to try and you know whether that's going directly to the to the you know the potential athlete themselves or parents, caregivers, schools by the sound of it, because you were excluded from gym. I mean, I don't know, maybe Catherine and Emily, you guys can weigh in. All of you actually can can weigh in. Does that still happen in schools? Like people are physically being left out of of, uh, of gym like, because they're different? What do you guys I think see? it happens less, but I'm sure it still happens, unfortunately. I, like, I know that there's people like us and other organizations trying to help with that just let people know that yeah they can be included it just you might have to make a few adaptations but i'm sure that there are places where it still happens unfortunately but hopefully we'll get to a point where it's zero eventually zero, exactly well i'm excited for later in the call when we open up things to networking to hear from jill as well because she's done some work in getting um you know uh, getting people involved in sport and particularly i'm interested in her sharing her experiences across the globe because she's done some work with um, some other countries. So we'll we'll jump into that, Joe, when we get to the networking session, okay? Perfect. Um, okay, does anybody else have any questions that they want to throw at Candace? I mean, she's going to be on the call the whole time anyways. So, you know, if you have questions later, we can do that too. But is there any anything else anybody wants to ask? Specific perspective? Caroline? I, I, I just have a quick question, Candace. Thank you for sharing your awesome story. I think it's awesome, just amazing to listen to it. Um, I'm just curious, just in terms of you being a part of things, have you had an opportunity to sort of um, see yourself having an impact on uh, on younger younger girls, younger players, boys and girls, actually. I don't want to limit it just to girls, because I do think it's important for boys to see all the great things that women can do, um, physically speaking. So I'd just love to know if you've had anything that sort of sticks out to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I try to live my daily life as being that person for some, if, you know, if I see another a younger kid on the street and they're looking at me or wondering a question, like I always am that person who's like, yeah, ask me, what do you, what do you need? Like, what questions do you have? How can I help you? What's going on? Um, but, you know, also just in, I have a, a five-year-old niece and a three-year-old nephew and I just, I make it like a mission for myself to, to, you know, make them be aware of what's going on. And well, aunt, this is why auntie's in a wheelchair. This is why auntie has one leg. And, you know, auntie plays wheelchair tennis in which they came out actually a couple weekends ago to the try it day and they were in the sport chairs playing tennis. Um, so in that way, yes, for sure. And it's definitely not a big, as big of an impact as I would like it to have right now. Um, but, uh, you know, doing things like this, I think are going to change that, you know, that's my ultimate goal is to have that bigger impact on, you know, young women and young men and, and showing them that, you know, this is the way things are and it's okay to be different and you're, it's okay if you can't do things a certain way, there's always a way to do it, you know? Um, so for sure, like I definitely, like I said, don't have as big of an impact yet as I would like to have. Um, but it's definitely on my, on my plans for the future, for sure. That's awesome. That's great. I uh, appreciate that answer. That's, uh, that's right. uh, very insightful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so I'm going to jump us into the next part of this conversation. And I'm going to launch a poll. 
Um, and um, you'll be able to find that poll. If you're on your computer, it's in the right-hand corner. I'm going to launch it now. Um, it's in the right-hand uh, corner. Well, you'll see a link that comes up to say I've launched a poll. Um, or in the right-hand corner of your screen, there's a circle, a triangle, and a square that says activities. And if you click that, then you can see a polls button. Um, and the question on the poll is, you know, you know, whether you're an, you're an athlete or you're part of an organization, um, you know, or you're just interested in this topic, you know, what do you see as the top participation challenge for encouraging women or men or boys, anybody really, to try sport, fitness, and physical activity? Um, we saw the numbers were quite striking in terms of, you know, number of women who don't participate. Um, Okay, great. So awareness is one of the biggest. And, you know, I think it's it's great that we're talking about trying sport right now because that's the first step and awareness is run hand, hand in hand with that, right? Um, so that's, that's great. That's a perfect kickoff for our conversation um, next with Catherine from Onpera. Um, and Catherine, I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can we can chat. A little bit more about here we go here's our workshop here about building program awareness um and tribe programs it's over to you perfect thanks tina um so yeah i included some information just about us and you know what we do today just because i wasn't sure who would be on here but i'll um i won't take too much time on that i'll just introduce us quickly so overall, our organization, we're the governing body for three different sports in Ontario. So wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis, and wheelchair rugby. Those are the three sports that we govern. So we're responsible for programming at all levels from grassroots all the way up to high performance uh, provincial level programming. And we have lots of different programs. We have school programs. We have um, awareness programs, outreach all those different things, but again, all just focused on increasing opportunities for participation across the province and different communities at all levels. So that's overall what we aim to do. You can go to the next one. And then just a quick overview of the three sports again. So um, wheelchair tennis, Candace talked about a little bit, very similar to stand-up tennis. And if someone is looking for an individual sport, um, a great one that once someone is set up with a sport wheelchair, they can play anywhere on a local court. So if they have a nearby court, a great sport to play with family, with friends, just to get outside and get active. Um, our other two, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, are team sports. So anyone who likes that team atmosphere, uh, having you know the support of teammates, really, really great sports as well. Wheelchair basketball is very inclusive for all physical abilities. So you don't actually have to have a disability to play recreationally, but even up to uh, team Ontario provincial level. So we get a lot of siblings playing together, family members, friends, uh, all joining a sport together, which is a really cool experience and makes people more comfortable when they're, they might be new to sport, going out there for the first time. It's nice to have a friend or family member with you. Uh, and then wheelchair rugby is also a really great community of athletes, um, a little more restrictive in terms of who can play just with the eligibility, but, um, it's a really great community for athletes who support each other outside of sport as well. Uh, we find that people are very engaged in, you know, helping each other with daily life and, and tips for that as well. So those are the three sports that we offer and try to continue to build programs and participation opportunities. Um, so yeah, in terms of our programs, just as an overview, I uh, already mentioned all the different levels, recreational, competitive, high performance. We have a provincial league for wheelchair tennis, um, just aimed to provide a competitive opportunity. Um, previous to this, there was nothing before international levels of comp competition. So this is designed to provide an intermediate competition opportunity. And then we have a wheelchair basketball league as well. And lots of introductory programs and skills clinics 
we have a very vibrant wheelchair basketball schools program. Hopefully we can get back to that soon. It's still paused at the moment, but that one's very popular. Uh, and then I will spend a little bit more talking about this later, but we have a program called Gear and it's designed for women and girls, um, girls enabled and ready to play is what that stands for. So I'll get into that one in a little more detail. All right, we can go to the next one. Perfect. So this is our main outreach program. It's called Bridging the Gap, and it's actually a national program. So it started in BC, and then uh, we were the next province to take it on, has since spread across the country. Uh, but essentially, it's an awareness and first involvement program designed to increase opportunities for participation in parasports. The three core sports across the country are the three sports that we run as a PSO, so wheelchair basketball, tennis, and rugby. Um, but if you've been to a have a go session or heard about any of that introductory programming, it's all part of that bridging the gap program. So that's my main responsibility. Uh, that's what my main role. But um, these have a go sessions, either in person or right now virtual is a big part of it. We also run information or education sessions for clinicians, so physiotherapists, recreational therapists, just to let people know that the opportunities are out there, let people know who can play, uh, let people know that it's not just people in wheelchairs that take part in wheelchair sports, all of these things that people might just not know about, just trying to spread that information. And then providing those introductory programs, that's okay, you can go to the next one, okay. um, introductory programs to guide people through that transition process. So we know that trying a new sport can be intimidating, trying a new anything can be intimidating. So our main goal is to make sure that we provide a positive first experience. So when people come out that first time, our goal is really to just make sure people have fun. Uh, we're connecting people with programs, clubs, and coaches that are a good fit. So appropriate for their age, their skill level, their goals, their interests, whatever that might be doing our best to make sure that that first time out is a positive one so that they come back to encourage people to, you know, come back that second time, third time until they're comfortable. A big part of that transition process is our awesome athlete ambassadors and peer mentors. Um, so Candice is one of our athlete ambassadors. Uh, we have lots of other great ambassadors who do a really great job of connecting with people on that personal level. So connecting about sport and, you know, sharing their information from that athlete perspective, but also providing other types of support. Like, how do you get there? How do you drive there? Do you, you know, what kind of chair do you use? Um, how do you transfer? Here's how I transfer. All that kind of stuff is a lot more meaningful coming from someone who's been through it. So our athlete ambassadors are a huge part of our programming. Another factor that we find, uh, again, this is just from our perspective, all of our experience through the programs we run, um, but that individualized support. So every person is different. Every person is starting from a different point. So we try our best to meet people where they're at in terms of their readiness for sport. Some people might be, you know, ready to go and get in there right away. Other people might want to come watch first before they try it. Uh, we find that everyone's starting from a different point. So. It's about the introduction, but also then continuing to follow up with people and make sure that we're listening to what they need to get involved in that sport. We've talked a lot about barriers to participation. I think we're all kind of on the same page in terms of what barriers are out there. Uh, of course, there's cost of equipment, cost of programs. So we're always trying to make that as affordable as possible. Uh, we have a sport wheelchair loans program. That's our biggest um, a form of support that we try to provide when it comes to equipment. So making sure that people have that equipment at an affordable rate um, to participate in whatever they choose to do. We work a lot with network partners. So right now we are a very small group when it comes to staff. So we're really trying to build partnerships with either clinicians at rehab centers or educators or community program leaders, anyone who can help us share information, anyone who can recommend people to us that might want to try sport, might be a good fit for different sports, really working with that network of 
partners who we know will be able to help with that awareness piece. Uh, and then we have myself, the staff person focused on outreach, education, and first involvement. So not every sport has someone dedicated to that. I mean, there are lots of sports that people know about already, but our sports aren't necessarily one of those. Um, Candace mentioned, you know, she's never, she had never heard of wheelchair tennis growing up. So the awareness piece is what I marked as my, as our biggest challenge, um, participation challenge, even though it's something that we're working on all the time. So that's still the biggest piece I find. Um, an example is we, we have a program, a wheelchair tennis program that we got started with the city of London, which is in the program guide in the city of London, which is great, but adults or parents who have kids with disabilities don't think to look in the program guide because they just assume that there won't be any programs in there for them. So that's an example of something where we have to go about promoting the program a little bit differently because we realized people just weren't going looking for it in that fun guide or whatever the program guide was. Um, so yeah, we're always looking into different ways to spread awareness, different ways to promote programs, to reach people because we have the programs, we know there's people out there, but it's just finding out how to get those two together. Hmm. And then we can go to the next one. Perfect. So I think I mentioned most of this already, but um, have a go sessions, big part of bridging the gap. It's the same as a triad session. It's called have a go through bridging the gap, but supportive and welcoming environment, um, making sure that there's you know, peer mentors and quality program leaders there. Sometimes it's based in the community. Sometimes it's based in a rehab center. It just depends where the interest is and where the resources are and all about the social connections and trying to encourage continued participation, whether it be in one of our sports or another sport, whatever it is, just trying to encourage people to stay active. And we can go to the next one. Uh, so again, I don't think I need to spend a ton of time here, but we do have a sport wheelchair loans program. So whether it's a multi-sport chair for basketball or tennis or a rugby chair, or even a racing chair, uh, we do have an equipment loans program to try to reduce the cost of equipment as one of those barriers that we know are in place, especially for newer athletes who don't know yet whether a sport will be for them. Next one. Perfect. So I think this is the program that will be most uh, applicable to what we're talking about today. So we run a program called GEAR, stands for Girls Unable and Ready to Play. And it was founded um, by, the idea came to be by Christina Sweat, a uh, wheelchair basketball athlete who's very involved in uh, leadership role as well in the broader sport world. But it's women and girls only wheelchair basketball program. It's for all ages, all abilities. It's all about fun and social and meeting people and just getting out there to play with wheelchair basketball skills involved as well. So we host, uh, they're called Gear to Play Days, clinics in, in different places throughout the year, um, led by Christina with other female mentors. And it's just a really great program, a really great environment. Uh, it has been very successful. And I think now in our wheelchair basketball program in the province, we actually have about a 50-50 split in terms of uh, female athletes versus um, boys. So previously there weren't very many girls participating in wheelchair basketball, and now we have almost half and half. So I think that itself shows how successful the program has been and just making sure that you know people who are coming out have a good time, but also encouraging people to, to stick with it, to stay with sport, um, just because of all the benefits it can have. So that's one of our, yeah, one of the programs that we've worked on that we're really proud of and hope we can get back to soon enough. And yeah, there's just a little bit more about where the program came from, from anyone, for anyone who is curious. So uh, founded by Christina Svet, as well as Chris Chandler, who is a coach uh, with a wheelchair basketball club called the Burlington Vipers. The first year day was in 2015, and since then we've run 17 sessions for a total of 93 participants with and without disabilities. So we were able to find some funding for a pilot in 2016, 
and have since integrated the program into other programs and events that we've been running and just all about building relationships and community partnerships with different organizations. So we hope to continue to build the program into maybe including other sports or bringing in mentors to talk about different topics that might affect the women and girls who are participating and just continuing to develop the program. Of course, COVID got in the way a little bit, but this is where we left off and where we're hoping to pick back up again. And just in terms of anything that we have kind of learned along the way or anything that we've found to be helpful. Um, so if there's a particular sport that someone is looking to start in a community, our first recommendation would be to try to find the governing body, you know, the community champion, whoever runs that sport, you know, at a wider level might have resources or know about existing programs or be able to help. Um, I know that if someone came to us from a community and said they wanted to start a program, we would do whatever we could to help them get that sport started. So that's um, number one. And then we just, the other thing we recommend is focusing on engagement and keeping people involved outside of just competition, high performance, really emphasizing that sport can be fun, it can be recreational, and then, you know, competition comes later, that comes down the road, but making that a safe, fun, inclusive, encouraging environment uh, where people can just enjoy their experience with the sport. And then just be patient. So growth takes time. Sometimes we start with two people and for us, that would be a successful program. We'd say, you know, we got two new people. That's great. If growth happens over time, even better, but it will definitely take time to get things going. And yeah, I think that's all we have for now, but happy to chat with anyone or answer any questions or, you know, continue to talk about any of this. That is uh, awesome, Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, I'm going to open it up to the, the rest of the uh, the crew. Does anybody have any specific questions for Catherine around best practices or some of the things that her organization um, does to build awareness and um, you know gather gather some of the participants for these programs? I love, by the way, Catherine, that your programming uh, much of your programming is open to all because that would feel to me like a good way to build awareness because if other people in the community know about it then it'll you know spread more widely that's how i found out about a lot of the sports mm. i played with with was just word of mouth so the bigger you can make it yeah for sure the more the merrier <laughs> anybody have any questions for catherine no um i have a Question for the athletes on the call, uh, Candice and Jess Lewis just joined us too. Hi, Jess. Um, how do you feel about um, kind of widening the scope of some of the para sports to incorporate, um, you know, everybody able-bodied people as well? Um, how do you feel about? How do you feel about that? I'm just interested in knowing. Um, I think it would be, you know, an incredible opportunity to help with um, just the awareness factor of, um, you know, para sport and what people with disabilities are capable of doing, um, and you know, just kind of what is available um, for them as well. Yeah. How about you, Candice? Yeah. I completely agree with Jess. Like, I think the like Catherine said, the more the merrier. Um, you know, the more word we can get out there, the more funding there can be, the more opportunities there can be for both disabled and non-disabled participants. Um, you know, it, I think it would be fantastic. And I, I do want to say also as well, uh, Catherine mentioned the wheelchair loans program, which is how I got started in wheelchair tennis was because of that program as well and being able to rent a chair. Um, so I do just want to put some importance on that aspect of Ampera as well as something that they do. That is a fantastic game changer for so many people who can't afford the chairs. But... <laughs> That's amazing. Thanks. Caroline, you had your hand up? Yeah, I did. Um, just a quick question just to the athletes and uh, the folks on the on the call. You know, around the whole, we, we talk about building awareness and, and engagement and letting folks know what's um, out there. In terms of messaging, what do you think is important to help uh, the girls understand around parasport? Do, do, do you want to experience sport just 
for the sake of experience sport, or do we want to emphasize around the para sport? Like I mean, at the end of the day, we're all just people who want to be on the move, right? And so that we're all capable of doing it. What what would you recommend from a messaging standpoint that you would want um, uh, programmers and 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 um, organizations use in their messaging to get girls out? Like what what you know, what would you want to hear as, as someone who's participated in programs? Um, I, I'm just curious to hear what kind of, what you would want to hear in terms of, you know, inspiration. Um, I think maybe just, you know, that it's, it's going to be a fun experience. Um, you know, there's going to be lots of, or hopefully lots of people there um, that you can learn from. Um, and it's not necessarily just always about the sport. It's about, you know, developing as a person as well. Um, and there's going to be opportunity, you know, for friendships and, and you know, that social connection um, as well as, as the sport. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I agree with this again. Um, you know, all of that as well as I think just focusing on the inclusivity of everything. You know, like growing up as someone who was disabled or is disabled, um, we didn't, or at least I didn't always feel included, right? So knowing that there are programs out there that are inclusive of both people with disabilities and without disabilities, and we can play together, you know, like that's something that growing up was unheard of for me. You know, I didn't get to play with the other kids in the sports because I couldn't, right? So I think just for me, the stressing that inclusivity of, of, of the programs, um, and again, you know, the social aspect of the making of, you know, new friends and new experiences, like for me, joining wheelchair tennis was game changer it changed my life right like I am you know no longer this person who sits in the corner and doesn't want to be noticed it took me a long time to realize that I had every right to take up space in the world right as a disabled female and we don't get to hear that a lot you know there's nobody out there shouting from the rooftops that we we belong right so I think for me that's a huge thing for sure that's amazing thank you for sharing um, yeah thank I, you I I'd like to open it up to, to uh, maybe for some of the other um, folks that are on the call, uh, maybe T Tammy, you can start by jumping in to talk about, you know, do you offer up, like maybe just introduce yourself and where you're from and talk to us about any of the kind of uh, things that you're doing to build awareness and get pe getting people to try. All right, sports? <coughs> yeah. So um, I, my name's Tammy. I'm with the Pickering Football Club, and I run a program here called the All, Ab All Abilities Program. Um, we provide recreational programming, not specifically soccer, just so that you know, um, to uh, children and youth with uh, developmental or intellectual disabilities. Um, so clearly, COVID, um, you know, we're all going through our challenges. Um, I think one of the um, biggest challenges that we've had over the years not having anything to do with COVID is the whole awareness aspect of our program. We And the funny thing is, is um, we do collaborate with a lot of other organizations. We have fantastic outreach with other, um, with our municipality, um, amazing partnerships, and still <laughs> we, we have space in our program. Now, right now, I know that that's due to COVID. I know that a lot of our athletes and particularly their family members, aren't ready for them to come back to the program. But it seems to me that there is a need for programming and we have, we're providing that opportunity. Um, and I, I don't know how we can do a better job um, in uh, getting our program information out into the community. Because I think actually we do a pretty good job. But again, our numbers aren't where they should be. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any feedback for me that or any suggestions. Um, I certainly am not a marketing person at all. Um, I'm a talker. Um, so um, I, I don't, I, do, I just don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Well, I think the first part uh, is having the programs. So that's amazing that you have them. Uh, Catherine or Emily or Jill or anybody else on the line, do you guys want to jump in and guess you might have in, in building some awareness around the program? I was going to say we have the same challenge, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that's the same thing. Like, the, the programs are there. You know the people are out there, and it's just sometimes it 
takes time. I mean, we have programs that started two years ago and only now we're starting. I think it's a lot of word of mouth too. If you get a couple of yeah. people that are yeah. loving it, then they're going to tell people they know about it. So yeah. I think for us, that's been, when we do see programs grow, that's a big part of, of why more people mm -hmm. come in. But yeah, definitely still a challenge that we're always trying to figure out solutions to as well. And All right, well, if anybody here knows of anybody in the Durham area that wants to do some recreational programming, we're here. Okay, we're well, that's, well, you know what, if you, um, what I'd like to do following this call is have you all send over your programming information, and we'll make sure that it all gets posted on our hub, um, and also in the follow-up materials we have, and we, we can all share each other's um, programs because we know we all know people from different different areas and so I think that's one of the first steps here is us sharing not only amongst you know crossing the borders of athlete and organization and um, you know health professionals but also for us to share each other lift each all of each other up because it'll just you know push us that much further I mean I love the notion of you know going out to um, build awareness amongst schools municipalities mm -hmm. um, Lots of, um, we have a partnership with Neighbor, um, which is the old Snapped. Yep. Um, those community organ um, media organizations are really happy to promote programming in places where people might not typically tend to, to look. Mm -hmm. um, but this whole, this whole networking thing is, is really helpful. If Does anybody else like um, Jill or Emily or um, I know we have um, Shireen on the line. Do you guys want to weigh in on this awareness? challenge um i can weigh in i agree like so much of what everyone has already said is totally on point a big thing is building those relationships with key people who do have contact with families or people of those with disabilities right it's like going through the rehab centers tapping into the like there's the big days now where it's like um you know, the schools have specific days where, you know, kids with disabilities have a track and field day and it's having a presence and trying to be there and, you know, connect and let them know beyond this day there's programming and let the teachers know and let the parents know. Um, but it is so hard to reach, like, to reach out. And especially when you end up running into, like, um, communities that aren't necessarily as present or as open, like the new immigrants, um, they, you know, are sort of trying to tackle into those communities where there could even be a little bit more um, shame and taboo around things like you having a child with a disability. There's just, there's so many barriers. On a very um, strategic level, something that I've always felt would be really powerful, but it takes a big push and a big effort, is to get the media and especially the sports media to be covering more of the disability sport movement. I know they try to with the Paralympics and like even that's like pulling teeth. Um, but I remember, you know, being in Nairobi and flipping through channels and coming across a whole bunch of South African wheelchair basketball teams like being played like this whole tournament. And I was like, this is just on TV. Like it was amazing. And I just wish that, you know, when they're running down, you know, hey, this happened with the Leafs today and this happened, like throw out some things about what's happening at some of the huge big international or national events that you know our teams are playing at and stuff like make it casual make it just known and and commonplace so I think that's I mean a whole other push um but that's an area and I think more than ever um I know the funding isn't there but I do think social media is an incredible platform. There are, you know, I'm sure there's groups of like moms with kids with different disabilities. Like there's a million mom groups. I can only imagine there's mom groups specifically and, you know, groups of people collecting and having conversations and it's trying to like tap into those um, and sort of really leverage. It takes a lot of work <laughs> to do that, um, but that's definitely where a lot of conversations are, are happening and, it's hard. And I know having worked, you know, in that world, when you have like a long to do list, like searching on social media and spending a ton of time and creating a presence there, you know, um, is is not always the easiest. And then if you do have turnover, like that person's gone and then their connections are gone and, and that kind of stuff. But um, but yeah, those would be kind of two things that I have always been. I just feel the media, the sports reporting there needs to be more. I've heard so many people say, even just like, oh, I was out at a hockey game and then sledge hockey came on. And, the, you know, as the 
on ice, whatever. And they had no idea. And I was like, ah, oh, how do you not, you know, know these things, but obviously they don't. And anytime you can just have more awareness, have an opportunity, you know, someone, it's always like one person that just reaches out and says, Hey, like someone that used to work for athletics, um, uh, for anyone who knows David Gregg, I remember he used to go up to families that had kids with disabilities, like walking on the street, just be like, just so you know, there are sport opportunities. And I was like, that's awesome that he's just like so passionate. Um, so yeah, the more that we can all just kind of be out there spreading the word and connecting to those hubs, places, places like this, you know, on Para, Parasport Ontario, Variety Village, wherever, you know, you can tap people into so they can get their exposure and their first experience and stuff like that anyways that's my two cents oh that is that is great feedback and I, and I did want to invite you all to leverage our platform as a means of media because because it doesn't exist in mainstream media that's why we've created our own media platform so that we can showcase all the great things that women can women of all you know cultures abilities races whatever it is you know it's that's that's the intention so please you know that's one of our things and share your stories like there's an opportunity for you you know to have your own page and you can share your own stories and then we can cross share it um the one thing we have um one of our members emily shevers um she's um visually impaired and she has a, an organization called um true faces and I asked her because she's growing, she's young and she's growing her social media um, feed quickly. And I asked her how she's reaching people because her, her philosophy is that she, you know, her philosophy is that anybody, uh, everybody is special and everybody should be able to tell their stories. And what she did was she said in her personal feed, she basically was going into the back end of her Instagram where it's feeding you like minded content and started directly targeting the people that are being surf searched that way. And so it's just brilliant. I mean, you just have to talk to people who are, you know, in their twenties and, <laughs> and they'll give you all the social media tips you need. But I thought, you know, it's so basic, but it's, it's so great. So if your feed already orients you that way go into what's being delivered when you do the you know the searches and you'll get tons of great content that way too um shireen i think you had pulled yourself off of um there you are hello nice to meet you do you have anything you want to you want to add around um building awareness or any programs that you've been a part of that have been um uh, from a try it standpoint that have been good um so I definitely think in terms of like awareness and being able to share that, um, like even with uh, on para, I actually volunteer for them too. Uh, being able to try it and say to other people, maybe I don't know anybody that may have a disability or want to do sports, but at least if they're saying, oh, you're trying it and you're volunteering and you keep going back, you enjoy it, they're going to want to share it to other people or maybe they know somebody else that's a part of it. So definitely even saying, if you don't directly relate or may have those experiences, at least trying it and then share it for word of mouth. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Is there a program in particular that you've tried that you uh, really enjoyed or that you've heard of that you think is, I heard you say on Para, so are you, uh, have you actually <laughs> any of the, uh, any of the sports? Um, I can't choose a favorite because I've actually tried all of them. Um, a few times, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so definitely, I say all of them. Even um, from on pair, I've even tried out uh, cruisers too. So being able to try like all of the programs, anytime there's like a club that's like, I have a program, I'll try it. <laughs> and so what um, I'm interested in understanding, I'm sure the rest of the crew is too. We've heard from you know from Candace around what made her want to try that initial sport. What is it? for you that's important for for i mean you've tried so many now so probably it's like <laughs> nothing for you but what, what is it for you that is important when you're considering trying a sport um my thing isn't so much like if it's a sport that's available i don't know if i like it until i try it and then if i'm trying it and being able to learn different things that I probably would have never known before and being able to share that experience saying, I don't have a physical disability, but I've tried the sport. Maybe you, someone else knows about 
somebody that may have an interest in a sport and want to try it out. So they're saying, oh, you've experienced this. Let me give it a try. It may not be a sport I'm familiar with, but I want to know more. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, any other challenges that people want to bring up, bring to the table? Yes, actually. Okay. Um, I definitely think a conversation around physical literacy is a challenge. Um, with the statistics we see, you can tell that women in general don't necessarily, may not know the benefits that physical activity can, they can actually reap from physical activity. Um, so many women drop out of sport, even me in my personal experience, I, it was almost like an expectation going through elementary school that I wasn't going to play sport in high school because it just got taken to that next level. And I was much more recreational than competitive. Um, and with that being out of my life, I really stopped physical fitness and activity um, as a whole. So I think it's important that we just keep talking about physical literacy and emphasizing the importance of health and wellness and how sport can truly impact a woman's life for the better. So do people, um, you know, in your experience for anybody on the line, are people feeling like um, if somebody, uh, maybe parents or caregivers that, that physical activity may actually cause, like uh, may hurt, their child or may not maybe they can't do it like is there something to be said speaking to the psychology of it with parents I mean just you're you're nodding your head do you want to weigh in on this in terms of um, educating parents on, on um, this? yeah I, I definitely think like just kind of from my experience of, of um, you know talking with some parents they do they kind of put their children with disabilities kind of in a bubble sometimes um, and I know that um, speaking from, you know, my relationship with my mom, um, she always says, you know, that would have been me if it wasn't for, you know, Windreach, which is a program here in Bermuda um, that got me involved in sport, um, as well as, you know, my doctor um, actually told her um, that she should let me do whatever my older sister who's able-bodied would do. Um, so it's definitely just having that again, more awareness um, for them as well that, you know, there are programs out there and and yes, you might need to be a little bit more careful on the way that you participate in it, um, depending on what your disability is, um, but there still is a way that you can do it and there's, you know, so many benefits that can come out of it. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Caroline? Just a quick addition. Uh, I think all these comments are fantastic. I just want to do a shout out to a program, Catherine, that you, your organization offered, and I was fortunate enough to cover a couple of years ago, was, uh, was a, and I think it was the first day, first time your organiza organization ever provided how to or try it programs for two sports on one day. And there was, and it was sledge hockey and wheelchair basketball. And I, it was amazing to see, like everybody loves the fact that, you know, in the morning they did wheel, uh, sledge hockey and then in the afternoon it was wheelchair basketball. And you could really tell that everybody came away with going, you know, not only did I learn one, I can do two. And so it's, it was exciting to watch that. And I, I think I just think it's important to have these really cool innovative ways to, to give folks a go. So just a quick little shout out to that particular program. I'm going to um, thank you, everybody. I'm going to jump into our next part of our presentation where um, Emily from Parisport, Ontario, is going to chat with us about her insights and best practices on starting your own club. Um, this may not feel like it's um, necessarily for you, but it might be because anybody can start their own club. So um, I, in particular, am thinking, Emily, about the gentleman, the father that was on our call, the last call, where his son. Um, learned to play bocce ball um, and um, he asked the question of how do I start my own club um, so I this is really valuable information and we should share it out with people that we know because um, you know the more clubs we get out there the better so thank you Emily um, I'm going to hand it over to you I'm going to share my screen and here we go OK, 
Okay, over to you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I am Emily from Parasport Ontario, and I'm going to talk about how to start an adaptive sport club. Um, not necessarily program on para, I talked about that a lot, um, but these slides just have good references, some good resources for everyone. Um, so this, I didn't know who was going to be on the call. I just wanted to give a little brief starting point for existing clubs and programs um, that aren't necessarily um, catering to para sports. So what is being para ready? Para readiness is a concept that stems from um, two other concepts used in sport management literature. Uh, so the first is organizational readiness, and that's referring to the shared commitment and capabilities to implement organizational change. Secondly, capacity building, which refers to the ability to effectively use all of one's resources. So from those two main concepts, the Steadward Center for Physical Achievement um, at the U University of Alberta developed a tier system for organizations identifying key factors um, to be a part of para sports and the adaptive fitness industry. So the first one being a connector, uh, you probably lack the capability to start a new para program or club in its entirety, but you're putting in the effort to research existing programs and you're devising a nice referral program or at least creating a pathway so that anyone who comes into your organization can be referred um, to a proper program or the right expert. You can be a contributor, so offer resources, including facility time, coaching, equipment, volunteers. Um, so that's really seeing the tangible um, resources come into play from each organization. And then you can also be a collaborator. So that's starting para programming or more than willing to partner with an existing local program to aid in their development. And you have kind of all, you're really proud of that. So you wanna advertise it everywhere. Um, and you are community, communicating that to your entire audience. Uh, next slide, please. So starting a club and program are different activities. Uh, they come with different processes and outcomes. Um, there are several focused funding programs in Ontario that are targeted towards startup para sports, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, next slide. So how to start a club? This comes from the Ontario Business Central.ca. Um, so there are basically two structures that clubs can exist in uh, in Canada. So you can be a not-for-profit club under the Canadian Corporations Act or a charity under the Income Tax Act. So first steps, you want to write on a business name and obviously have a physical address for any um, important needs for your business. It's important that all of these things happen and that a geography is included in your business name is the best strategy to take. Um, that way people know where the sport takes place and what is taking place. So that you also want to establish at least a minimum of three directors um, that's required at all times for corporations in the province of Ontario. And the province of Ontario will also provide a number of pre-approved templates for an athletic or sport club. Um, and we will be able to provide those resources after the presentation. And then you also need to complete a name search nuance report. So this is a mandatory report for not-for-profits clubs or charities in Canada. It's mandatory six page listing existing business names relevant to your proposed name. Um, and those are all pretty straightforward. Uh, if you wanna hit the next slide. So then there is a third option, and that is what Onpara highlighted today, and that's starting a club as a member of an existing provincial sport organization, um, such as Athletics Ontario and Onpara. So the benefits of being part of a governing organizations are um, the pathways that already exist to competition, the opportunities for funding and offsetting travel costs, and um, grants for coaching education. So this is a similar process if you were to start your own independent club. However, you must apply for affiliation and or membership like at the start of the year with the PSO. Um, good examples to look into online uh, come from Onpara, Athletics Ontario, um, Badminton Ontario, and Ontario Volleyball. Um, 
So this is just touching on how parasport programming is a little bit different. There are a number of programs that have been developed through academic research. I've listed the next two slides are kind of about um, programming models that have been defined by academic research. Um, launching a program is often part of a knowledge transfer, like for example, from community to campus. So the first example of that is a program in a box. Um, this comes from Holland and Bloorview. And it, so Igniting Fitness Possibilities is a two-stage program for participants to engage in inclusive, fun sport. Um, phase one is a quick start. So they just have a 16 week stage offer once a week. It's pretty straightforward. And then stage two, they move into something more specialized. So whatever the child um, was drawn to or whatever their coach or mentor suggests for them, that's the sport that they will go into in phase two. I believe it's also 16 weeks and that's available again, in the resource package that we'll get after the presentation. Um, another example of program in a box model is the active start from the Ontario University of Technology and kids action from the University of British Columbia. So a branded program, there are currently two well-known organizations in Ontario that provide training resources um, and support to implement a branded program. This is more for existing organizations. Um, so Special Olympics has their Partners in Play initiative, which fosters the development of partnerships between Special Olympics Ontario and existing local community sport organizations. And then there's also the Challenger Baseball Model and Jay's Care Foundation, um, which are great examples to follow by. And then next slide. Oh, hold on. Oh. Great, right, here you go. It's taking a minute. I don't know why it's not coming to you. Hmm. No worries. Uh, oh. uh, okay. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to stop sharing and reshare again because we're losing our. Uh... One second here. Try that one more time. Sorry, guys. There we go. And then the third type of model is the uh, customized program. So I actually messed up step two and step three here, um, but this would be what OnPara is doing with their programming right now. Um, so you're designing your programming that can take anywhere from two weeks to two years for some individuals. Uh, it all depends on the process. And then step two would be piloting the program. Um, so for example, I had OPC Pathways Project is currently working on how to launch pilots successfully, but it is highly underdeveloped in the province of Ontario. Um, there is existing resources out there from OPC's Pathways Project, including Community Sport Club grant, I believe it is, and that provides financial and knowledge support to communities, clubs, um, to start a new program or recover COVID impacted programs. And there's also Pararetti Communities, which aids in providing financial and knowledge support to communities to start sports councils and adapted multi-sport programs. Um, step three in a customized program would be looking at program support. So kind of the review stage. Um, the resources that I have for this come from the Ac Academy and Center for Accessible Sport and Play. Um, other resources online that are great to look at include Innovation in Inclusive Sports and Recreation, which is a trainer's manual, and then also Inclusive High Five Principles of Healthy Childhood Development. And then these are just some steps to legitimacy in Ontario. Um, so firstly, you want to have coaching. Um, when it's starting a club, it's not necessarily essential to have certified coaches, but obviously this is something that makes a club legitimate over time. Um, so coach mentorship is available through the Coaches on T Association of Ontario and OPC. And then coaches and mentors can also look at the quality participation blueprint from the Canadian Disability Partnership Program. 
that is available online for anyone to see. Um, fundraising is another step that is obviously crucial for charities and nonprofits to survive and thrive. Um, most organized clubs have their own fundraising projects, but there are grants that exist, such as the Parasport Jumpstart Fund, which supports organized, integrated, or adaptive sport and physical activity programs for children and youth. And then there's also the Ontario Trillium Fund, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Um, and they provide a range of grants and the active people stream um, to support nonprofit organizations, including the Youth Opportunities Fund, which would be applicable to starting a club. Um, the next two steps that I have to legitimacy are the club membership fee. Um, obviously, this is we, we want to keep it as affordable as possible in para sports. Um, there are a lot of equipment costs that need to be covered. So typically, um, this would keep in mind projected travel costs, club administration expense, and any um, PSO membership fees. And then you also need facilities and equipment to kind of be perceived as a legitimate club in Ontario. Um, however, not everyone has access to that right away. And a great resource to go to would be like the Parks and Recreation Department of your um, municipality. That or the existing local sporting organization. Okay, and um, well, that is my presentation on how to start a pair of sport club. Um, thank you very much, uh, Emily. Um, and we're looking forward to, oh, hold on, where am I going here? We're looking forward to getting those templates and uh, sharing them out with everybody. Um, does anybody have any specific questions for Emily around starting a club? I, I just have a quick comment. Um, Emily, I think your presentation really clearly shows that, you know, it can take a lot of time and effort and a lot of hoops to go through. And there's so many different organizations that are doing great things, which is sometimes why, you know, the left side may not know what the right side, which may not know what the front side, which may not know what the back side is doing. So it's wonderful that you were able to present so much great detail to us today because it is so, so important to know everybody who's out there and what all the great things they're doing. So thank you for that. Yeah, it was um, it was a struggle to find these resources in the first place. Um, it's very it's very fragmented, the industry, but slowly but surely and just as you know, these programs develop over time, the research is developing as well. And hopefully it'll be standardized um, very soon. I wanted to ask a question around um, ambassadors for clubs, sports ambassadors. Like, what is it, you know, I mean, we know that the best word of mouth is from people who are playing the sport themselves. So maybe for some of the, you know, the people that are on the line right now who are participating in sports, like, you know, Candace and maybe Jessica, if you guys want to weigh in on, um, what opportunities you would consider as an ambassador and what kinds of things you look for. Mr. Candace. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said before, any opportunity to grow Parasport in general is a great opportunity and I'm more than willing to do what I can when I can. Um, you know, that being said, I don't have a lot of pull, um, so I would do what I could, but I mean, definitely, you know, clubs that are just starting out, um, I would love to be involved in, in like the grassroots version of that and, and getting something started up, um, you know, not necessarily something that's already put together, um, but just being involved in any way possible to get that up and running, because I just think it's so important. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the more opportunities that we could have to, you know, talk about, um, you know, the benefits of, of being in the sport, um, you know, and what it's given us and, and um, you know, what it could provide for somebody else, I think is really beneficial. Um, you know, one of the things that my family would always say is, you know, if you don't live it, you don't understand it. So I think it, it can be very powerful, um, you know, coming from somebody with a disability, um, that can you know relate on a different kind of level um, than maybe an, an administrator could. 
So I think, um, you know, if, if you have that opportunity to, to use an athlete um, as an ambassador, definitely to do it. <laughs> I'd, I'd love yeah. to jump in if I can. Um, mm -hmm. When I was with Parasport Ontario, we were developing the new market shredders um, sledge hockey program and it was sort of municipal. Um, it was awesome because they the Magna was going to give ice time and everything, but it was definitely a community. The idea was to create a club and it was so awesome. We had a number of guys from the provincial national team come out to some of the sessions and just be there and inspire the kids and they would play on the ice and whatever and just kind of create excitement for them. But also they were out like, you know, just generally spreading the word. Um, so it was a really nice, like they weren't heavily involved in like coaching or anything. It was just that idea that they were going to come out and the kids were so excited to meet like Billy Bowden and all those kind of guys. And it was really awesome. And it was just a really fun day. And we made it, they made it a bigger day. It was one of the days where it was like a come out and, you know, bring other kids and bring siblings. And, uh, and so, yeah, opportunities like that for ambassadors, people, you know, at the higher level in the sports to come out and connect and kind of show up at some of those grassroots events and make them a big deal um, and things like that are always amazing and the the kids love it and it makes it super exciting. So yeah, there's amazing opportunities for ambassadors. And Jill, that's a great point. I tried sledge hockey at Magna and it was in the middle of a, tur a hockey tournament that we had. So that's another way to do it, right? To incorporate programming where you know, other programs programs are having in the are happening in the mainstream side of things. Yeah. And we had the national, like the sledge hockey national team, I like teaching yeah. us and boy exactly. did I Yeah, like that. I mean that was such an amazing experience overall. But um uh that's awesome. Anybody else using ambassadors or tapping into ambassadors in their organization? Tan, are you guys using ambassadors? It's actually something that I had tried to start um, before COVID, um, and uh, yes, so we we never followed through with it um, at the time because I was trying to find just the right athlete, um, and uh, it's something that we will look at again as our base builds up again. Yeah. I think it's and important I, to have those examples and mentors. Um, yeah, we've exactly. actually created a new program uh, for our older athletes that have been with us for, um, I mean, our program has been around the last 13 years. So we've got athletes that started with our program when they were 12 years old and now, now they're young, young men and women, where our current uh, program doesn't really um, deliver enough of a challenge. So we've created a new program and it's more of a mentorship program where we're trying to teach them skills to get into the community um, and become more confident in what they're doing. And we actually have created um, a, a badge program with this too, much like the scouts have. So they're able to um, focus on uh, volunteerism, coaching, um, giving back to the community. I have one, <laughs> I have one of my athletes, his name is Elliot. <laughs> and he actually is quite new with our program. I say new because he came into our program towards the start of COVID. Um, and he's just been a powerhouse with our program. He, um, he's <laughs> been very motivated to get um, uh, these, these merit badges and they're, they're really nice badges. Um, but, and he's um, organizing a, a fundraiser walk for our, our program next month. I think he'd make a really good um, ambassador for our program, but it's about teaching our older athletes to give back again to our younger athletes. Now we're encouraging them to come to our program and act as a volunteer because it's great to have examples of, you know, our, our, our young <clears throat> athletes on the field seeing people like them who are working, you know, who are, who are giving back, who are included. Um, so that's been a real um, positive part of our growth um, over the last two years, which is I'm happy to say that we were able to, <laughs> to provide some sort of growth over the last two years. And, and what is the name of that program, Tammy? Um, it's called Learn to Train. Learn to Train. And is it, do you have to have been a part of the club, um, to get into that program or so, is it? So that's a good question. So not necessarily, although everybody that is um, with this program currently has been a member of our club. 
Um, and we do, um, we do suggest that all of the participants are 13 and over, just because it does require a little bit of maturity. Um, we really do focus a lot on soccer skills with our other program. It is very much physical literacy. Um, well, this program, it's we're trying to get them more integrated into perhaps recreational program, get them integrated into programming within our community, um, and then possibly become a member of the um, Canadian para soccer team. I didn't say that in the right <laughs> way at all, but... Um, but they only have a men's team, which I'm sort of not really happy about and have been um, pushing back a little bit, trying not to offend anybody, but giving my opinion <laughs> where it might not be wanted. <laughs> um, so, but I understand that there's change coming with that and they have a goal in um, creating a women's team within the next two years, which I think will, will be amazing because um, I know our men's team does get they do a lot of traveling, they get coverage, it's wonderful, although they don't get national coverage, but um, that's wonderful. It'd be good to see some ladies out there because we, we need, Amazing. obviously, to focus more on ladies in all sports, um, women, and uh, yeah, anyways. Well, thank you for sharing that, Tammy. I can we, talk, I can talk. We'd love to see more of that information, so please do send it along and we'll share it with everybody. We'll share it on our platform so people can see it. I would love to hear a little bit um, I'm just doing a time check and respectful people's time. If you can take a couple of minutes, Jill, to tell us about some of the work you're doing abroad to help, um, um, you know, people get involved in people with disabilities get involved in sports, and and um, and then we'll do a quick close up. Sure. So, quick background: I did work for Parasport Ontario, 2008 to about 2011, and that was when we had just started the community sports, I was their community manager or development manager. So I was running the Ready, Willing, Enable program. We just started the community sports development program. We were still running the Ontario Parasport Games and had started the Toronto, I uh, started the Accessible Sport Councils. So it was awesome. I've been mission staff for Canada Games with some of the para teams as well. Um, I worked for the SAO after that. And, um, and yeah, so following that though, I left and spent a year in Uganda taking my disability sport background with me. I, I figured if I was going to go for a year to know what my future held, at least if I stayed in that realm, I could come back to this world. And I worked with a small organization called the Kids League. They had an adapted sport league that they were just starting up. And so basically they would run like football programs for able-bodied kids. And on the same field at the same time, they would have an adapted sport league and would bring kids from a number of different disability focused schools and communities and places um, to participate. So I helped with that. I consulted with the National Paralympic Committee while I was there, um, including on some of the legacy stuff from the 2012 Olympic games, which was awesome. Um, towards the end of the year, I really realized that a lot of the partners were all very scattered um, in terms of the stakeholders and what they were all doing. And so I organized and facilitated the first National Disability Sports Summit in Uganda, had about 50 people participate, including someone from the IPC actually flew down, someone from Motivate UK flew down. It was an incredible day. We learned a ton. We wrote a report, posted it on the International Sports Development website. And then a couple of years later, I was actually contacted by Blaze Sports America um, because they were applying for a USAID grant to go and do some disability sport work in Uganda. I consulted on that and then they actually brought me on as a facilitator, sending me back to Uganda three times to run additional sports summits, train the trainer programs and um, children's sports festivals and things because I had that contact and all of the, you know, groundwork and knew how to knew how Uganda ran. Um, so I'm still currently heavily involved in Uganda work that people are doing. I'm currently um, on the board of the Ugandan Wheelchair Rugby Federation that they're looking to start up, including a, a like a local team. Um, I've helped promote sports up into the refugee camps in the north, um, bringing people down, connecting them into you know the urban capital in Kampala. I've done work in Gulu, um, all sorts of stuff. And I returned home and couldn't go back to the nine to five. Started a business where I do um, transformative travel coaching, so that's a whole other thing I do. But my passion personally is to still do um, disability sport development. There is such a great need. So many people with disabilities um, in Uganda. I'm still on the Toronto Accessible Sport Council here. That's how I stay involved and connected 
um, with the Paris Sport World here. And I'm and yeah, I helped as one of the co-founders of the Toronto Tornadoes, um, which is awesome. I love to see what Christine is up to. That gear program sounds amazing. Um, I was connected with Matt Greenwood when he was the Pickering stuff was just starting. Um, yeah, Arnold Lopez and Archie and all those incredible people that are big game changers in this world. Um, so yeah, I've loved the world. After my three years, I'm a certified rec therapist. I was like, I even though I left the job, I was like, I'm still so passionate and I've stayed a lifelong just ambassador and advocate for sport for people with disabilities. And uh, yeah, happy to connect with anybody. If any of those things, you know, sounds exciting, whatever. I'm hoping to go back to Uganda again soon. Um, but yeah. Jill's that... going to write an article for us around uh, parasport in Uganda. So you can, we met, we met Jill last weekend at our Women yeah. and Dog Circle hike. So if any of you want to come out for a hike with us, oh. um, then uh, that's, that's how we're, we're, we're meeting with our communities. But, um, and if any of you, you know, um, feel, you know, that there's something you want to communicate out there and really get it out there, we'd be happy to have you be a guest blogger for us. And um, let's get the word out on all the great things we're doing. We've got a hub with events that can, um, you know, can be posted. We've got these ongoing circles. We'd love to grow this circle and have even more organizations coming. If there's a topic you think that's really um, intriguing to you, we'd love for you to put it out in the in the chat box at the bottom here because we can, um, you know, facilitate our next session around that. Um, if there's something that you, a really big skill that you want to share with others, um, we can also uh, bring you in as a, an experienced host like uh, we have with Candace and Catherine and Emily. Um, so please uh, use the chat if you have any topics in particular, or you can send us an email later. Um, we are really grateful. It's 1.30 um, to do a wrap-up. We're really grateful that we've had the time to get to know you all. And we, as we promised, this would be a deeper networking session, not just us kind of spewing stuff out to people. Um, and I think we achieved that. And um, I wanted to say thank you. Is there, are there any closing words, Caroline? Do you want to say anything in closing? Uh, just a, a, a warm and appreciative thank you for all of you to, for joining us today. It's uh, it's so exciting to hear all the great things you're all doing and appreciate hearing the challenges that you're facing. And I do think um, the power of many was, is on display here. And I, I do think, you know, the potential for all of us to do great things together is, is awesome. So thank you so much. Amazing. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, stay tuned. Please, if you haven't signed up for our circle itself, our Paramazing Circle, please come onto our site and do that because that's where we'll be sharing the blog posts and um, you know all these resources and stuff. So, uh, so thank you. And a particular thank you to Candice um, and Catherine and Emily for leading this great, great session. <laughs>